All right, so it is 4.15. We are going to get started pünktlich, uh, as they say where I'm from. We will get, get started here with Rebecca, who is going to give us a really engaging talk, and I'm excited to see what she has to say. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I didn't do anything yet, so thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking today primarily about user experience. And so this is a, a very hot topic where I work. Um, and I'm going to explain why at the beginning. Um, so I apologize for explaining our product, but it won't take very long. Um, and then we'll get into what we've done around our APIs, because we are using both REST and GraphQL concurrently. So very quickly, like I mentioned, we're going to talk about what cloud data management means, because that's going to really inform the user persona that we're talking about here. And then we'll get into some of our design principles, and then, of course, how our API is actually being used today. So cloud data management. Um, I work for a company called Rubrik. And so Rubrik uh, was actually founded in 2015, and we coined the phrase uh, because we apparently just hired a bunch of really brilliant marketers, um, cloud data management because we didn't want to use the term backup and recovery. That's really what it boiled down to. And so when we decided when we were going to design our system, this cloud data management system, we we're going to do it a little bit different. So there's a hardware component. We have to have storage, you know, potentially. So obviously that can be cloud now. Um, but there's storage as a part of it. So we knew that we wanted to be a converged platform with the storage and the hardware, or excuse me, the hardware and the software baked together infinite scale, but most importantly to this talk, and to me, was the API-driven architecture. Because trust me, when they called me and said, would you like to come work at Rubrik? And I Googled, and it said it was a backup and recovery company. I said, no. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, being able to access your data. And we were born, if we, we always say we're born in the cloud, right? Because we we're only about four and a half years old, right? Almost five now. So a little bit about what our customers experience, right? We do data management. So one component of that is backup and recovery. So primarily in 2015, we were selling to the data center. And very quickly, after we released our platform, we introduced the ability to protect your cloud instances running in AWS and Azure. Now that's where we got you. <laughs> that, was our, that was the smart business model. We said, now we have all of your data across your different hypervisors, across all of your different physical servers, across the cloud. What are you going to do with all that data besides just protect it? Okay. And that's where we started introducing things like the ability for data assurance, anomaly detection. If something doesn't look right, we're going to tell you. Governance. I want to know where my PII information is. Make sure it's in the right place. And then, of course, being able to fail over from on-prem to cloud and back. Right? So doing DR. So as you can imagine, when we start talking about an API-driven architecture, most of the people using our API is not a developer. And that's what makes it a little bit interesting for us. And so when we were talking to our customers at the very beginning, we knew that our APIs had to be very good, but they had to be there. Because this is what we heard from our customers in 2015 before we released our product. They said, backup and recovery sucks. And we said, we know. That's what we're here to disrupt, right? Um, but other companies were licensing it. You had to have some super duper deluxe version of the product to even have an API. But the API wasn't built initially. It was something that was bolted on after the fact, or it was a shim layer on top. So very poor performance. So that's what we knew we had to target, right, was that customer that was going to be using the API. Because if we visualize what our competitors were doing at that point, it was saying, oh yeah, no problem. Why? <laughs> First, I'm going to design the, the plane. And then I'll design where I'm going to store the plane, right? Nope. They designed where they're going to store the plane and then built way too big of a plane. And then guess what? We said we can solve around that. So we knew that we wanted to do a little bit of a different approach. So to kind of visualize it, right, because this will play into it later, so at a very high level, right, obviously this is a slide I stole from marketing, um, we have our hyper-converged platform on-prem for data protection, but we also have the ability to run in any public cloud. Well, I shouldn't say any, the big three public clouds. And then we also introduced last year a SaaS platform, right, to start doing that add-on stuff, right, to be able to do the anomaly detection, to be able to do the data government governance. But there was like, several years between us releasing our core platform and us 
releasing our SaaS offering. So in 2015, we made the design decision to use REST. But then, fast forward to late 2017, when we're starting to plan a product that we're going to release in 2018, we said, I don't know that REST APIs are the right thing for this product. So ultimately, we went with GraphQL. Now again, if we think about our users, that introduces a bit of a problem. So, like I mentioned, we started at the very beginning with REST because, to be perfectly blunt, GraphQL was not really an option at that time. We were releasing a product in early 2015. It did not get open source till the end of 2015. So, we ended up adopting it later, after the fact, right, in 2017. Now, we have a very kind of high level of idea of what we kind of do. Let's talk about how we designed our API, because that's really the meat of this. So as you can imagine, we said, well, beyond just being an API-driven platform, besides just being this API-first marketing buzzwords, what are the APIs for? Well, obviously, front end, talk to back end, yay. So we always tell our customers, and it's, you know, it should be very obvious to everyone in this room, we say, every click you make in our UI, everything that you're touching is an API call, because it is. Right, we are, uh, we dog food our product, right? We dog food uh, and we use our own API. So when we started talking about how do we want to design it, conceptually we said, well, we know that we want it to be backwards compatible because bluntly, we don't know what we don't know. We're introducing a brand new platform. So we knew backwards compatibility because we knew versioning was going to come up at some point. We knew we wanted it to be very easy to use and to be composable, to have our users be able to create things on top of the API, and in the future, create apps on top of our SaaS platform, right? So none of this is probably that crazy. This seems, okay, reasonable. The problem that we ran into very quickly, oh man, that took me back. I was in the military, I almost dropped to the deck. I thought, shh, sh things were going down there for a second. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the thing that we ran into initially was we made the decision, we said, great, in 2015 we release a product, we're going to make every API that we're consuming internally for our UI, we're going to make that available to our customers. And at that time, to be honest, brand new product, we only really did one thing. So it wasn't that crazy for us. But within a year, we saw massive adoption of our API, which is awesome. We're like, yay, automate all the things. But then we had a fight internally about this. Because engineering said, right, if we go back a few slides, uh, the API is there to connect front end to back end, right? People use this thing? That became a thing that guy kept getting said around the office. Do people actually use this? So we had to work out some internal, to be honest, kind of political roadblocks here. Things that we said heard from engineering, right? We already mentioned people actually use this. But then when we started adopting GraphQL, Last year, when we, uh, or 2017, but last year when we released the product, the big thing that we fought was the need for user documentation. They said, well, GraphQL self-documenting, it's fine. Have we heard that one before? Okay, that's probably no surprise. And then our product kept growing and growing and growing, so they just said, yeah, just create new endpoints, just create new endpoints, just create new endpoints. No problem, right, for our REST API. And then my personal favorite, it's not my problem, each individual engineering team, each different part of the product is responsible for creating their own API endpoints for REST, right? So we had some inconsistencies, and then we tried to fix those inconsistencies, and we got told, that's not my team's problem, right? So as you can imagine, this created friction internally, but more importantly, or, and most affected for our customers. We didn't really have an API version <laughs> besides here you go, public and internal. I'll get to that in a second. And we cause several breakages. And there's only so many times that you can uh, cause API breakages for an enterprise scale company who's using your product before they get pretty upset with you. And then we didn't really have any specific standards internally. We literally just said, here's our design principles, follow that. Okay. And then of course, we were a rapidly growing company. We were growing massively. So this is where it's a little, again, a little bit focused on our product, but we release quarterly, major releases. And so we're constantly introducing new objects that we can protect and manage across many different hypervisors, 
operating systems, clouds, and so on. So how do we give a very uniform look and feel to the API for our product when we're managing so many disparate data sources? So that was a very big point of contention for us. So how do we solve that? Well, for REST specifically, we start getting into versioning, right? We'll talk about that in a moment. But we wanted to make sure that we were really leveraging HTTP to simplify. So again, different teams managing different endpoints it became a problem. So we would have some teams, for example, do something like where it says ugly, where it say post, add a node, post, remove a node. Why? Right? That was a real thing that we did originally. Different team. But then you'd have a completely other team say, post, add file set, delete, file set, right? And kind of doing it more properly. So we had to standardize that across the board. Boolean, okay, again, no problem there. And then if we wanted to make sure that we organized everything in a very logical, hierarchical, but future-proofed way. And luckily, we did that okay from the beginning, so there was not major changes there. So for example, we would say hypervisor. Well, what type of hypervisor, right? And then it'd be VMware or Hyper-V or whatever it is, right, nested underneath that. So it was very much the child-parent hierarchy that we had to make sure that we were enforcing across the board. Now, originally, when we said, okay, we need a version better, we need a control better, we introduced V1. Right? So now we have internal, which we told our users. Internal means, you know, this is new endpoint. This may not even be a GA feature yet. This is, you know, use at your own risk. Things might change. But once that endpoint is a part of V1 or any version, it's good to go. It's safe. You can trust it. Yeah, what we ended up doing was we just kept putting everything in internal <laughs> and then put nothing in the properly versioned part of the API, so then of course we started having massive bloat on internal. And our customers could use this. And we're just introducing breakages like it was nobody's business, because oh, it's internal, right? Use at your own risk. So no joke, last year we started looking really at it and said, 95% of our endpoints are in internal. We're only saying 5% of our endpoints are actually available for safe, trusted, supported use. That's garbage, right? That's, we, we need to do better. So versioning with REST, right? So we see the disclaimer at the bottom, uh, GraphQL. We introduce version, V1, no problem. We start migrating endpoints over to V1, okay? But then we introduce V2 this year. Oof, now we're working through that as well. Let's migrate things into V2 because eventually we're going to get rid of V1. So another political battle. Originally, we decided, you know what? We're gonna boil the ocean here. We said, by version 5.0, all of your endpoints that are GA, for any feature that is GA, needs to migrate to V1, or needs to migrate to V2. That did not happen. So now, it's become very much a team-by-team -team conversation of, for this particular, because we go back to the surface area, for this particular type of data source, this has to get versioned by this date here. Right? And we're communicating that to our customers, so that's holding our engineering teams accountable, myself included here. And then, of course, we are specifying and truly using internal for the new early access type functions and features that, are, are, that really might change, that really might break, but trying to really steer away from it. And something should not live in internal for more than one release of our product. Right? We either need to deprecate it because we're not going down that route, or we need to properly version it. There was a fun conversation that we had about versioning. Uh -huh. So I wrote this long thing when I went, me, I'm the, I'm the author here. Uh, where we went, <laughs> a fun thing internally was, well, if we introduce versions, then there's no breakages. False, obviously false here. This just is controlling when that breakage occurs and where it occurs. And that's the most important thing is it's not random that our users know that when this version comes out, this will no longer be available to them. They need to update their code. They need to update their tool. They need to upgrade whatever integration that they had, right? That's the important part is it's not randomized. It's very predictable. It's known and it's communicated. 
So this is not just an external effort. This is also very much an internal effort to our support, but also to our own engineering teams, because they are, in some cases, a bit siloed. Right? We have to communicate, and we have to specify what those rules of versioning are and when it must happen by, and we have to stick to it. So ultimately, we actually introduced, for lack of a better term, kind of a change management board, but it's three of us, of senior engineering leaders, who at every single release look through everything and make sure that it is correct for anything new that's being introduced. Make sure that it does follow the correct schema for GraphQL, or does follow the correct guidelines for versioning and for the hierarchy within REST. And then we communicate at least two versions before something is deprecated if it is properly versioned. If it is a GA endpoint, we say, you have two more versions before this is deprecated, so by the time 6.0 comes out, you need to update your code, here's what's changing, here's where it's changing, here's why it's changing, but really provide that communication that, to be perfectly blunt, we didn't for about two years. And then, of course, whenever we do introduce new features and functions, a lot of times we introduce them first in the API, and then it comes into the UI after the fact. So it is giving those very specific code examples and demonstrating what the use cases are for those new endpoints that are being introduced. We finally felt like, okay, we've got a, we've got a good uh, grasp on REST now. We've completely un... I would use the ba bad word here, but we fixed a lot of the issues um, that we were experiencing. And then we introduced a new product, right? And that's where GraphQL came in. So, jokingly, that's where the new challenge appeared. So, in 2017, that's when we began that initial research for our second product. And we decided GraphQL for several reasons. The biggest one was simplicity for our end users. They could effectively do one query most of the time to accomplish what they needed to accomplish rather than doing five, six, seven REST calls. That's really what it boiled down to. The fringe benefit for us was better performance. For us and for how our product is architected, we were getting about twice as good of speed, twice as good of return from GraphQL as we were from REST. But really, it was the flexibility, it was the ability to have a little bit more robust of a query and fewer API calls. Now, since then, not only did we introduce this in our SaaS offering, and we started from scratch there, right? There have been a lot of learnings. There's been a lot of stabilization that we've had to go through. And to be honest with you, we haven't fully made every single thing with GraphQL public because we're still facing some versioning, or excuse me, not versioning, some stabilization type issues. But we also made the conscious decision from the, from the perspective of our user, we don't want them to use REST here and then GraphQL there. We want them to have a very uniform experience. So if they never ever go and purchase our add-on product, the SaaS, then they will only ever use REST and that's fine. But if they're using the add-on product and they're using GraphQL here, we also want GraphQL to be available on the on-prem product as well. So we introduced GraphQL alongside REST. So our users now have the ability for our core platform to choose REST or to choose GraphQL. Current state, like I mentioned, um, it's been um, mostly stabilization, and that's not always because of us. Um, with, our on pr uh, with our SaaS offering, we also are at the mercy of some of our uh, partners and the stabilization of their own APIs before we can really make ours public. Um, so that's been a fun one. Um, for example, Office 365. <laughs> Office 365 APIs keep changing, so we keep having to change how we're doing our own schema. And then, so we haven't felt very comfortable to make that public yet for our customers. So right now it's GUI. That's how you interact with Office 365 protection. We hope that this will stabilize in the next few months, that way we can make that available. Visualization. We have an API playground for REST, no problem. But that was something that very, very quickly, our users said, we want some sort of visualization tool. We want to see what this looks like. Because at the beginning, we just we, we, were, we honestly weren't sure how quickly GraphQL would get adopted by our customers. So we just said, look, here's a script. Put in your URL for the SaaS uh, platform. It will scrape all that information for you and then just drop that into a visualizer, go, right? That didn't last very long before they're like, no, you need to provide us something. So we are using primarily um, GraphQL and Voyager. 
And then we needed to ensure that, most importantly, authentication worked across the board uni uh, uniformly. So whatever you were using for the on-prem product, you could also use for GraphQL. So like I mentioned, what are our challenges? Documentation holy wars, I, um, I think we finally have won this one, where we finally have our engineering going, okay, yes, we'll write some documentation, um, and not just assume everything is going to be fine with self-documentation. Um, our schema, still in flux. That's, we finally got our grasp on rest, and then we went to GraphQL. And so the part of that also is versioning. Specifically, right now, because we're introducing so many new products into our SaaS platform, we are introducing and then going, hmm, actually, I think we might be able to do this a little bit better, a little bit more efficiently in terms of the API. So let's rework this a little bit, right? So how do we manage the deprecation and introduction of new endpoints without using versioning, right? So that's still something that we are grappling with. And I hope that next year I come back and I tell you how we've solved that problem, okay? So this may seem a little bit Kind of like some of it's like obvious, but let me tell you how our API is being used and why a user experience is very, very important to us. So like I mentioned, for the most part, the people who use our API today aren't developers. <laughs> We're a backup company, for, you know. So most of our users of the API are people in IT ops. These are backup administrators. These are database admins. These are VMware guys who are now learning to automate things. So when they talk about automating things, they're thinking using something like Terraform for provisioning. They're thinking about using something like Ansible for configuration management. They're writing scripts here and there to automate workflows. Awesome. Some of our customers are extremely sophisticated. And they have in-house developers on the far right. And they say, great. And there's usually some enterprise architect in the middle going, uh, we want to buy Rubrik, but does Rubrik integrate with this? And this is where we get to go, yes, we integrate with anything you want because of our API, right? But then we have to sit down with those developers, a completely different persona asking very different questions than, guess what, some script kitty over here. And they want to integrate X with Y, and they need us to tell them how that's going to happen. So as you can imagine, IT ops, it's been interesting. We, um, we hear a wide variety of things. One of the things that we hear is, I don't really care, I can do it in the UI. So there's some education, obviously, around why automation orchestration is important. Um, but the biggest thing that we hear realistically, even from those who are big believers in the API, they say, I don't really want to use your API directly. Give me an Ansible integration. Give me an SDK. I'll use Python. I just don't want to bind directly to your API. And then, of course, the fun naysayers who are like, automation APIs don't care. Everything should be in the UI. And if it's not, sorry. But I'd say the biggest percentage of our customers are actually the very last bullet point where they go, I get it. I understand APIs are important. I understand now every single time I'm doing a, you know, an RFP to buy a new product that there's a checkbox for APIs. But I actually don't have any idea how to use it. <laughs> so that's where enablement really came in. Because this is a big tenant of our product. We strongly believe in our API. We spend a lot of time, money, engineering, investing in having as stable and as great of an API as possible. And our partners, they build all kinds of amazing integrations on top of our product and with our product. It's the end user. And we have to spend a lot of time really focusing. And so we found that we spent way too much time actually on the tech and education sometimes, and not enough time actually fixing our own API, right? So then we went, we fixed our own API, we focused on hygiene. But we have a lot of customers who just are genuinely scared of things like GitHub. They don't know, right? They're genuinely scared to learn how to write code. So that's where we really spend a lot of time on enablement. So we, of course, introduced a developer portal, um, actually beginning of this year, uh, or our version of a developer portal that has a lot of the stuff kind of dummy-proofed for them. Here's a pre-built SDK, here's a pre-built integration. If you just don't even know why in the world you'd ever use an API, here's a massive amount of use cases of what you could do with our product and the API. I it was PowerShell. I, I, I'm, I'm not a PowerShell person. I'm like, pff, scripting languages, get out of here. But again, when we talk about our IT ops persona, we have to cater to them as well. So these are our tools like Ansible, PowerShell, and so on. But then we also have things like Golang, PHP, 
and so on SDKs for our developer personas that we're working with as well. But again, dummy proof it as much as possible. Here's the documentation, here's the code. And in some cases that will go straight to the PowerShell gallery, not to GitHub, to assuage that fear of GitHub, ooh, I'm not a developer. But the biggest thing that we're facing today right now is we're saying, hey, we have API for our SaaS platform. Are you using it? Because we found that on our core platform, we actually have over 50% of our users calling the API every single day. And we're having billions and billions of API calls every month. That's amazing. But then GraphQL came along, right? So now we've finally educated all of our customers about what REST is and how to use REST APIs and how we have architected our REST API and now GraphQL, right? So our big challenge next year beyond things like stabilization and documentation is education. So we've been spending a lot of time this year, and this is gonna bleed into next year, literally flying all over the world and sitting down with customers and saying, here's GraphQL, here's how you use it, here's how it's different than REST, here's things that are pre-built for you to interact with it. And so SDKs. Right, we spent all this time building SDKs for REST. Now we're turning around and building another set for our Polaris platform, our SaaS platform for GraphQL because they don't want to, for us, they don't want to interact with the API directly for the most part. They want that abstraction layer. They want that tool. They want that language. So metrics have been a very, very, very important part of <laughs> what we've been doing because we can't build everything all at once. My engineering team's not quite that large. So we prioritize based off of what APIs are being used the most, what endpoints are the most frequently accessed. So we've built a ton of internal tooling to gather that information across all of our platforms to aggregate that to make more informed decisions. And that was very, very tough, actually. So if we could do it all over again, to be honest, we would talk to the customer at the very beginning we built the API and then said, they'll come, and they did. But then they said, yeah, that's not exactly what we want, and that's not exactly how we want it, and actually we also want this too. We would have liked to have taken a lot more time in 2015, 2016, instead of having to fix it in 2017, 2018. Documentation, our documentation was pretty crappy, to be blunt, at the beginning. So we should have invested a lot more in user education and documentation from the very beginning, all right? Um, and I'm out of time, so I, I'm sorry, I will cut it off here instead of going through each of these. But if you have any questions, please reach out. Um, I'm happy to, to answer them. And I'll turn it back to you. That was great. <laughs> that, that was a talk I, I have not seen uh, quite like, so very good. Uh, you actually did have a few minutes because a little bit unfortunately our next speaker uh, is not here, uh, unless any of you are named at Zeus and want to give a GraphQL talk. <laughs> okay, so yeah, unfortunately, um, we had a no-show. So, any questions on that talk? We have some time, yeah. So, uh, uh, let's get a microphone to you. I have a microphone down here. <laughs> oh, thank you for your talk. Uh, so, uh, going through this journey, uh, the, sort of, the, you're at a stage of this journey of uh, building APIs. Uh, do you folks, uh, did you develop, say, some sort of style guide going forward for your different, uh, and you said, I like that you brought it up, siloed. And hopefully you'll fix that problem too, but siloed engineering teams are like, okay, well you, you'll deal with a stack and you're doing uh, you know, bare metal and then this hypervisor and so on. I'm gonna assume that your teams are divided by per hypervisor in each of them. Right, it's uh, per surface area. It's so basically uh, a style guide. I would recommend you guys develop a style guide. Thank you. Yes, we did. Uh, so I should have probably put a screenshot of it because like that, very, that slide that just had the check marks with like eight design properties, that's what we started with. We said, here's our design principles. If you're all really smart engineers, build the thing. And then we found out very quickly that my interpretation of that and your interpretation of that are different. And so now we have this very robust set of wiki pages and confluence that have very prescriptive of this is how you do it. And we try to generalize as much as possible so it fits every single surface area. Is that, is that public? It's internal right now, but that's a, actually great feedback that I would, lo I would love to publish it. 
Yeah. Uh, just a quick reminder also, we, the last talk is still happening, so Sean is still speaking, just the next person in line was not, uh, it's not here. So, another question. Great talk. So, uh, it sounded like uh, the REST APIs were doing very well for you, but then GraphQL came up, and you have to just switch to it. So, was there a need, or like uh, REST uh, APIs were not doing good? Uh, so you shifted to graph or, or like you wanted to try that out? That's a really good question. So um, kind of both. Um, so initially the decision in, that we made for our SaaS platform to use GraphQL was very much uh, an informed design conscious decision where we said, um, because originally before we in introduced a bunch of apps on top of the SaaS platform, the core of it was to do multi-cluster management. And so when we talk about like an enterprise data center um, and, you know, and cloud and wherever else your data is that we're protecting and managing, that was a massive potentially amount of clusters, right? So you might have them all over the world. You might have you know, 10,000 rubric nodes, for example, running in various form factors. And so when we said, great, now we're going to have the SaaS platform and it's going to be providing that multi-cluster basically data plane, GraphQL made a lot more sense for us because we are querying now instead of one cluster, right? We are querying potentially hundreds upon thousands of clusters across the world. And so for us, the efficiency that we got out of GraphQL versus REST for our Polaris platform, that's what it was driven by. And then the, you made the decision later for the user experience to have, if you're now you're starting to get used to GraphQL for multi-cluster management, but now I want to just manage one cluster directly, well, that was originally just REST, and that's where we introduced GraphQL as a second option for the kind of core platform on, to provide the, U, uh, the uniformity. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank Any you. other questions? I've oh, got one on the w way on the other side, so go on. You can yell. Yeah. All right, great. You, you mentioned about the when moving your teams to V2. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's kind of exactly the conversation that we had. So originally, we said everyone needs to go to V2 by this next version. And to be blunt, that just didn't really happen for many, many reasons. And so we took the approach because, like we mentioned before, um, I'm calling it like a siloed engineering team, but it's not super siloed. It's more of just you have your very specific focus area because our platform is so broad and what we can protect and manage um, that we decided instead of trying to say everyone go this version that we went, okay, all the hypervisors are moving to V2 by this date. And we sat down with the hypervisor team and said, and we coordinated this, planned it, and then we migrated them first, right, as an example. And then the next, you know, release ended up being the next team, which might be like databases all the database information that we're ingesting and protecting, and then we help them migrate from one version to another, rather than just saying every single platform migrate. So it was a bit more political, really, than, than anything for us. But the end goal is for all teams to end up on the same version. You're not versioning teams independently. Not, no. Each different, that kind of goes back to our user experience, too, because uh, for our users, they, you know, if we're talking about an IT ops person, they're already like, when it comes to certain things about the API. So then saying, well, file sets are in V4, but hypervisors are in V3, which is, it was already hard enough when we introduced V1 and V2, right, where they went, holy crap, come on, I just got, oh, you know, adjusted to V1, and then we introduced V2. Um, so we made the conscious decision that we want to limit the number of versions that we have as much as possible, but it's just a part of it, right? We introduced V2 actually originally to be able to talk from our core platform to our SaaS platform. Um, and that's why I got introduced. And then we went, well, we don't want to have internal V1 and V2. So now we want to start migrating things slowly out of V1, and then we'll eventually retire V1, and you'll just have internal V2. I think we have time for one last question, but I need to bring the microphone to you so we can record it. Um, so do you have, first of all, it would be great if you could share your standards because I'm also trying to work on some standards for GraphQL. Um, you mentioned that you have documentation. Do you have documentation already available for 
your APIs? For, for, for Graph, yeah. For Graph, we, <laughs> we do, but you have to be a customer to have access right now. We're working on okay. opening it up publicly, because right now our REST API documentation is publicly accessible, um, but our, <laughs> our space is pretty competitive at the moment that we're operating in, so we're very like, well, let's not tell the other company how to do it quite yet, um, to be honest with you. Um, and so right now we do have the documentation, but it is customer only, but we are working um, with the goal to completely open it up. But the style guide, I might not ask permission. I might just do it. I'd love to share that, yes. Great, so excellent questions. And once again, that was a great talk. Really appreciate that a lot. It is uh, actually real, real quick, a quick hand of applause for that.